What if I told you that the world as we know it is about to change forever? Imagine a reality where everything you think is stable, everything that feels right falls apart in a matter of years. Seven years of chaos, trials and revelations that will expose humanity's darkest secrets. Does that sound scary? For Revelation warns us that the future holds much more than we can imagine. The tribulation is the last chance, a devastating and transformative period that will test every heart and every choice. These tribulation years are not just ancient legends nor metaphors for other times. They are a direct warning to all of us about a future that requires a definitive decision. The horsemen of the apocalypse, the trumpets and the bowls, each of them is a call that echoes through suffering and hope, inviting everyone to reflect on what it truly means to seek salvation. And while some resist, others will realize that this is the last and only chance for redemption. Now I invite you to look closely at what this seven-year period really means, because this is not just about the future, it's about how we prepare for it. Are you ready to understand what Revelation really has to say? because if there is a time to seek answers, it is now. During seven years of tribulation, the world will see what it is really like to be on the edge. To outsiders, the idea may seem like an apocalyptic legend or a fictional movie, but for those who immerse themselves in scripture, this period is real and it was prophesied to expose without filters the true moral and spiritual state of humanity. Imagine a world where the search for salvation becomes almost a race against time, where every act of rebellion has immediate and visible consequences, with no escape, sounds intense and it is meant to be. The prophecies of Revelation reveal that this phase represents a final call to repentance, a stern and relentless warning that humanity must finally wake up to its decay. The word tribulation alone evokes a sense of fear and urgency, right? Imagine living in a time where everything we know begins to crumble. The prophecies guarantee that this will not be a period of occasional disasters, but rather a sequence of calculated judgments, each deeper and more devastating than the last. Modern civilization, so comfortable in its routine, will see these seven years as a sequence of chain impacts which do not stop. And it's interesting to think about. These judgments will not only be in the physical, but also in people's hearts, confronting them with the reality of their own sins and choices. There is then one last divine appeal in the midst of chaos. In this scenario, those who still doubt the need to turn to God will realize that the old warnings were not just a metaphor. Scripture is clear. The tribulation is both a test and a final act of mercy. In other words, grace is mixed with divine justice. Those who have long ignored the prophecies about the apocalypse will have a chance to recognize the call. And for those who think that repentance is something distant, the tribulation makes a point of leaving this reality close, almost palpable in the events around it. Those who have not yet prepared themselves for the return of Christ will feel this charge in their hearts and consciences with no time to lose. But what kind of events can be expected in this time of trouble? The answer is not simple, and what lies ahead seems to defy our understanding. We are talking about natural calamities, supernatural disasters, and an unprecedented social upheaval. Like a book unfolding into chapters, humanity will see the fulfillment of the signs described in Revelation. But what few see is that these events also reveal a profound truth about the human being itself, moral decay and lack of repentance. And the more time passes, the more evident this division becomes between those who seek salvation and those who persist in rebellion. For those who have heard about the apocalypse but didn't give it much thought, these seven years will be a constant reminder that one cannot escape one's final destination. It is curious because for many the apocalypse is just a heavy word, a distant term. But what if we thought of it as the final phase of a long story that was already unfolding? This period of tribulation is precisely the climax where the divine purpose takes visible form and every prophecy about God's judgment is drawn in front of us. In the midst of chaos, many will desperately seek a way out, a form of protection, but sincere repentance will be the only true security. 
Imagine then a city taken by disorder where the fear of God ceases to be a choice and becomes almost an instinct. During the tribulation, chaotic and intense events are both a revelation and a warning. What we see is not only destruction, but a call to spiritual awakening. For some it may be too late, but for others there is still a thread of hope. The interesting thing is that in this context of despair, the call to faith becomes a powerful source of strength and rebirth. Many people, in the face of all this, will recognize that salvation is not an abstract concept, but an urgent necessity, almost like breathing. These seven years of tribulation, however, are not only there to scare or punish. There is also a lesson in them that repentance is still possible, even in the midst of the worst of scenarios. Each stage of the tribulation represents in reality a chance, a new invitation. It is an almost audible call, a call to spiritual rebirth and preparation for Christ's return. There are those who say that these events are the final proof that humanity needs to reconnect with the divine. After all, how can someone witness so much judgment and still ignore the need for change? And for those who accept this call, there is the promise of a unique transformation. For those who respond to God's call, Christ's return becomes more than a prophecy. It is a living hope, something that beats and grows in their hearts. The tribulation then becomes a preparation for renewal, a time when every suffering paves the way for salvation. Judgment ceases to be a burden and becomes a purification. This is what the prophecy of the apocalypse wants to teach us, that at the end of these seven years, those who keep the faith will be ready for a time of peace and justice, but there is still a lot to be unveiled. The trials are not over. During the tribulation, God's judgments take shape gradually and intensely, structured into three revealing phases. The seven seals, the seven trumpets, and finally the seven bowls. At each stage, humanity is confronted with calamities that intensify, as described in Revelation 6, where the opening of the seals reveals the horrors that are coming. In the very first seal, Revelation 6, 1, 2, the rider of the white horse appears, symbolizing the conquest. Here the Bible presents us with an inevitable cycle of events that, as it unfolds, destabilizes what we know as the natural and social order, revealing that no human power is capable of containing the manifestation of divine justice. The seven seals bring, in each opening, a new challenge to earth. In the fourth seal, for example, we find the pale horseman, which represents death, followed by famine and pestilence, Revelation 6-8. It is a grim reminder that humanity, at its core, is not in control of its own destiny. As this judgment progresses, the world is beginning to understand the disasters that were once sporadic now become the new reality. Calamities affect all layers of life and at the same time reveal the moral and spiritual collapse that man, in his rebellion, has so ignored. Nature and humanity are intertwined in this pain as a warning that it is necessary to seek redemption. After the seals come the trumpets. These represent a new phase of judgment where the intensity of disasters reaches a third of the planet, bringing a more severe and profound impact. In Revelation 8, 7, the first trumpet sounds and a third of the vegetation is destroyed throwing humanity into a scenario of scarcity and uncertainty. The second trumpet is equally devastating, destroying one-third of the sea creatures and ships, Revelation 8, 8, 9. Trumpets go beyond physical harm. They represent the breaking of what man considered safe and stable. Every sound is an echo of divine justice, a reminder that men must turn to God before it is too late. Still within the trumpet scenario, we have the third, which introduces the star Wormwood, Revelation 8, 10, 11. This star embitters the waters and makes a third of the rivers poisonous, leading many to death. It is impressive to think that what was a source of life becomes a source of death. Here, the Bible teaches us that everything vital can become fatal when the divine command is disregarded. The symbolism of the star Wormwood also leads us to reflect on the effects of sin that poisoned the human soul. When faith is abandoned, the sources of hope and life become bitter, reminding us of the need to return to the Creator. After the trumpets, the last and most intense judgment presents itself with the bowls of God's wrath. 
Here, there is no longer a third of destruction, but total devastation. In Revelation 16, 2, the first bowl is poured out, and malignant ulcers appear on those who bear the mark of the beast. This verse is a direct warning about the consequences of turning away from divine protection. Instead of just affecting the earth, the bowls directly hit those who have refused to repent. The symbolism here is clear. Divine justice does not fail, and man must decide whether he will be the target of it or the beneficiary of its mercy. In one of the most dramatic moments, the fifth bowl brings total darkness over the kingdom of the beast, Revelation 16, 10, 11, leaving the followers of the Antichrist in anguish and despair. This act is not only a physical event, but a spiritual one, where the absence of light symbolizes the total loss of hope. Those who rejected salvation now feel, in a palpable way, the loneliness and pain of being far from God. The plagues that come with the bowls are not just warnings, but sentences for those who still resist. Whoever looks around will see that everything that exists is ruin, and in the face of this, the need for repentance becomes more evident than ever. The last of these judgments, the seventh bowl, heralds a great earthquake that changes the very structure of the earth. Revelation 16, 18, 20. Here, creation feels the weight of human acts and transforms itself radically. It is a moment where the earth itself seems to declare the end of human resistance. Islands and mountains disappear, cities are destroyed, and the message is clear. The end has come, and there is no escape for those who have defied God's command. This great earthquake is a final demonstration of divine power, a closing of a cycle that once again reminds us that all that has been prophesied will be fulfilled. The symbolism of the number seven, present in the seals, trumpets and bowls, indicates the completeness of divine justice. At every step, we see that there is no judgment without purpose. The book of Revelation itself reiterates that these signs are manifestations of an order that goes beyond human comprehension, bringing about the full realization of God's will. Each phase leaves a trace, a learning experience for those who want to escape condemnation. Gradually, humanity sees that there is no middle ground when it comes to following the truth. In the end, the promise of salvation remains for those who turn to God, but time is running out, and the choice becomes ever more urgent. By opening the first seals, the apocalypse presents us with an imposing and terrifying vision, the four horsemen. Each of them carries an element of destruction, revealing the state of rebellion and decadence of humanity. When the first seal is broken, we see the rider of the white horse, Revelation 6, 2, a figure representing conquest, power, and authority. This night is often interpreted as the rise of leaders and ideologies that promise peace but actually promote deception and domination. It emerges as a symbol of authority that seems righteous but whose intent is oppression. It is a stark reminder that all that glitters is not gold. Often that which appears to bring salvation actually hides servitude. With the breaking of the second seal, we are introduced to the rider of the red horse, Revelation 6-4, who carries a sword with him and represents war. This night symbolizes chaos and conflict between nations. Where there is power without wisdom and domination without compassion, war becomes inevitable. The red knight is the embodiment of the judgment that comes when humanity forgets God and seeks only its own will. He shows that when love and peace are replaced by violence, the result is ruin. Nations in this context fight each other and peace becomes something unattainable. This night reminds us that true peace cannot be achieved without God's presence. The third horseman, mounted on a black horse, carries a pair of scales in his hands, Revelation 6, 5, 6. It symbolizes hunger and inequality, where staple foods become a luxury. In a time of tribulation, the scarcity of natural resources arises as a direct consequence of greed and waste. This night evidences the judgment on society that prioritized materialism and ignored the needs of others. In the verses, we see the phrase, a liter of wheat for a denarius, indicating a scenario of extreme inflation. In other words, 
What was once basic becomes practically unattainable. This night is a reminder that without social justice, suffering multiplies and chaos thrives. By opening the fourth seal, we are introduced to the rider of the pale horse, the very incarnation of death, Revelation 6, 8. Accompanied by hell, this night represents the inevitable outcome of the previous three nights. Where there is oppression, war and famine, death is a natural consequence. It brings with it plagues and diseases affecting a quarter of the population. The Bible shows us that when humanity insists on living far from God, the end that awaits us is bleak. This night is the embodiment that without repentance, life is destined for destruction. It is a call to reflect on the consequences of a life without God, where suffering seems to have no end. The four horsemen together reveal a spiritual and moral breakdown on a global scale. Each of them symbolizes a part of divine judgment, showing that humanity is reaping what it has sown over the centuries. These knights are not just figures from a distant nightmare. They are the reflection of human reality when we choose to ignore the divine presence. In Revelation 6, 8, the union of the knights shows how the final judgment is something that humanity creates for itself when it chooses to walk in darkness. Human rebellion against God inevitably brings destruction and suffering. Still, there are those who recognize the call and seek salvation, even in the midst of devastation. When war, hunger and death become present, many begin to realize the fragility of their own lives and seek shelter in faith. However, for others, the rebellion continues and these knights continue to ride, bringing an even darker fate. Revelation 6 shows us that divine judgment is not arbitrary, but rather the response to humanity's choices. And in this scenario, each night represents a sign that time is running out and the search for redemption becomes urgent. It is important to remember that these nights are more than symbols of doom. They represent the opportunity to look within and understand that repentance is still possible. Their presence is, in a sense, a chance to correct course before all is lost. In an age of conflict and uncertainty, this passage teaches us that salvation is offered even in the most difficult times. The Bible invites us to understand that these nights bring not only destruction, but a lesson that without true peace, which comes only from God, humanity is destined to repeat these cycles of suffering. The horsemen of the apocalypse leave a clear message. Humanity needs transformation. They represent the unchanging truth that every action has a consequence and that the time to choose between salvation and perdition runs out at every moment. When the last rider rides, he carries with him the end of one cycle and the beginning of another. However, for those who seek truth and divine peace, these events are not the end but a prelude to something greater, a path that leads us to the next chapter of the divine plan. When we speak of the natural and supernatural disasters of the apocalypse, we enter a terrain that transcends any catastrophe known to humanity. The series of trumpets and bowls brings with it events of gigantic proportions where the planet experiences as never before the divine fury. With the first trumpet, Revelation 8, 7, we see the earth being struck by hail and fire mixed with blood, which leads to the destruction of a third of the trees and all the green vegetation. The impact of this event is overwhelming, destabilizing ecosystems and compromising the food of many. This scenario represents the fragility of human creation in the face of the power of the Creator, a reminder that everything we consider solid can crumble in the blink of an eye. When the second trumpet sounds, we see the image of a great mountain on fire thrown into the sea, Revelation 8, 8, 9, which turns a third of the marine waters into blood and causes the death of a large number of aquatic beings. The vision is almost cinematic, but the purpose behind it is clear. Every event is a reflection of human rebellion against God. The waters, symbol of life, become a symbol of death. And here, once again, mankind is forced to face divine judgment, seeing how even natural forces turn against those who refuse to seek repentance. For those who witness these scenes, the message is inescapable. Salvation is the only way out. 
With the third trumpet, we are introduced to the star Wormwood, which embitters the waters of rivers and springs, leading many to death. Revelation 8, 10, 11. Wormwood, a plant known for its bitter taste, symbolizes the bitterness of sin and its consequences. By embittering a third of the waters, this star reminds us that what was a source of life now becomes a source of death. Just as sin destroys from the inside out, bitter water reflects the contamination of what it should nourish. For those who seek practical lessons, this passage shows us that our actions have power over our environment and that spiritual contamination has physical and palpable consequences. Coming to the fifth trumpet, we see something that transcends the natural. The release of a plague of demonic locusts that plague mankind, Revelation 9, 1, 11. These grasshoppers are not ordinary insects. Their description is terrifying, and they are on a mission to inflict pain on those who do not bear the seal of God. They do not have the power to kill, but rather to cause such intense suffering that many will seek death without finding it. This plague, more than physical, is a supernatural manifestation of divine judgment, showing that the Antichrist offers no true protection to his followers. The pain of these locusts represents the weight of unrepentant sin, an anguish that cannot be easily healed. When we get to the cups, the judgment intensifies and becomes definitive. The first bowl brings malignant ulcers upon those who have accepted the mark of the beast, Revelation 16, 2. Unlike grasshoppers, these ulcers are not temporary. They represent a plague that torments relentlessly. It is interesting to note that those who have chosen to follow the Antichrist now experience the outcome of their choices. This passage is a reminder that alliance with evil never brings lasting benefits. Suffering is the fate of those who willingly choose to reject divine goodness and prefer alliances of destruction. Among the bowls, one particular plague draws attention. The great earthquake of the seventh angel, which transforms the very geography of the earth, Revelation 16, 18, 20. Mountains and islands disappear, cities are destroyed, and nature writhes in response to divine judgment. This event goes beyond an ordinary earthquake. It is such a drastic change that it reflects the transition from the old world to the new. To anyone who studies the scriptures, it is clear that this earthquake symbolizes the end of human power over creation. The implicit message is that every kingdom that does not submit to the Creator is destined to be shaken and destroyed. In addition to the physical disasters, there is a dense darkness that covers the kingdom of the Antichrist during the fifth bowl, Revelation 16, 10, 11. This is not a natural darkness, but a supernatural manifestation that torments those who refuse to repent. They will bite their tongues in pain, but they will continue to blaspheme God. It is a reminder that even in the midst of the worst suffering, some hearts refuse to surrender. This darkness symbolizes the absence of hope for those who have chosen to follow evil. They are literally and figuratively lost in the darkness with no light to guide them back to the Creator. Ultimately, these natural and supernatural disasters are not only punishments, but also opportunities for reflection and change. They show that even in the midst of chaos, God still reaches out to those who desire repentance and salvation. These events are reminders of what happens when we stray from the divine purpose, a final chance for humanity to realize the depth of its condition. Revelation invites us to see these disasters as warnings and not mere catastrophes. There is, behind every judgment, a chance to be reborn and seek refuge in the only one who can save us, for even though time is short, salvation is still offered. During the tribulation, humanity will face a time of unparalleled despair, where each person will be confronted with their own frailty and mortality, those who have never reflected on the divine purpose will be forced to face the inevitable, feeling the weight of their choices. The suffering caused by the trumpets and bowls opens the eyes of many, revealing that there is no escape from the consequences. In Revelation 6:15, 17, we see kings and mighty men hiding in caves, crying out for the mountains to cover them and protect them from God's wrath. 
It is a shocking sight where humanity realizes that regardless of their position or power, no one is above divine judgment. During this period, many will be led to seek faith as a form of relief and hope. When everything around them falls apart, people naturally turn to something bigger than themselves, trying to understand why such destruction is happening. The tribulation awakens in many a sincere search for meaning and redemption. However, not everyone will be ready for this spiritual transformation. Many will resist the call to repentance, refusing to acknowledge the truth. It is a striking contrast. While some cry out for salvation, others harden their hearts even more, as seen in Revelation 9, 20, 21, where many persist in their idolatry and immorality, even in the face of judgments. In the midst of this chaos, a specific group of people dedicated to bringing a message of hope and redemption emerges. The 144,000 sealed by God, described in Revelation 7, 3, Four. These men, from each of the twelve tribes of Israel, are given a seal of divine protection so that they can preach the truth in the midst of darkness. They are like beacons in a sea of suffering, pointing the way to those who still have ears to hear. With courage and unwavering faith, these sealed ones encourage mankind to seek salvation, reminding them that there is still time to find refuge in God, even in the darkest days of the tribulation. The presence of the 144,000 is a symbol of mercy in the midst of the trial. They represent the voice of God who, even in a scenario of chaos, does not abandon humanity. These seals are proof that divine grace remains accessible even when justice demands a price. And for those who listen to them, there is an opportunity for spiritual rebirth, a chance to break away from rebellion and return to the path of salvation. They, along with the survivors of the scriptures, carry the message that faith is stronger than any calamity and that repentance brings peace even in times of storm. Still, the impact of the tribulation is profound and many face despair without seeking a spiritual solution. Hunger, disease and catastrophes destroy the pillars of society and selfishness takes hold of many. Instead of uniting, Many turn on each other, trying to survive at any cost. Revelation 6, 4 shows us that peace is taken away from the earth and violence becomes a common feature of this period. Each one acts for his own benefit and morality dissolves in the midst of suffering. What should be a time of unity becomes a portrait of human selfishness in its most extreme form. The contrast between those who heed the call of the 144,000 and those who continue to rebel is a mark of that era. Those who choose faith experience a different peace even in the midst of destruction. On the other hand, those who remain blinded by idolatry and reject God's seal face even greater despair. The Bible makes it clear that those who have chosen the path of rebellion will find that every act of resistance brings deeper suffering. Peace will only be found in salvation, and God's sealed ones are there to guide anyone who is willing to listen. As the time of the tribulation progresses, many are beginning to understand that salvation is not just a distant promise, but an urgent and palpable need. In Revelation 14, 1, 5, the 144,000 are described as those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes, Remaining pure and true, they represent the ideal of an unshakable faith, serving as an example for all those who, in the midst of suffering, wish to draw closer to God. Their message is clear, judgment is real, but mercy is still available to those who accept the call to repentance. In the end, these preachers, along with the remnant of Scripture, plant a seed of hope in the hearts of those who seek salvation. Their presence reminds us that God never fails to provide a path to redemption, even in the most critical moments. The tribulation, with all its impact on humanity, becomes a period of choice to remain in darkness or to seek the light. And for those who decide to open their hearts, Christ's return becomes the promise of a new beginning, a path of peace after the storm. After the terrible judgments of the tribulation, Scripture tells us that Christ will return triumphant, bringing an end to the age of evil and establishing a new kingdom of peace and justice.
Revelation 19.11, 16 describes this moment in majestic detail. Christ appears on a white horse, called Faithful and True, with eyes like flames of fire and a sharp sword coming out of his mouth, symbolizing the Word of God. He comes to defeat the Antichrist and the entire evil system that has taken over the earth. For the faithful who have waited patiently, this return represents the end of darkness and the beginning of an era where peace will not be just a promise, but a tangible reality. The Antichrist, who during the tribulation deceived and persecuted mankind, will now be definitively defeated. Revelation 19.19 19. 20 reports that the Antichrist and the false prophet will be cast into the lake of fire, symbolizing the final victory of good over evil. This scene brings a restorative righteousness, where those who have opted for truth and faith in God will finally see the end of all injustice. The presence of evil will be eliminated, and the earth will be able to experience a rest that it has never known before. For many, this is the moment when salvation becomes something palpable, a reality that can be felt and lived. With the defeat of the Antichrist, Christ begins a millennial reign, where the earth will go through a period of peace and restoration, as prophesied in Isaiah 11, 6, 9. During this time, lions and lambs will live together, and creation, once tainted by sin, will be renewed. This reign is the fulfillment of the divine plan, where all nations will submit to the righteous and kind rule of Christ. Here we see a foretaste of what eternity will be like, a time when suffering and sin will have no more room, peace will be complete, and finally, humanity will live in harmony with creation and its creator. This thousand-year period is also an opportunity for those who survived the tribulation to experience a life centered in the presence of God. Revelation 20, 6 states that blessed are those who are part of the first resurrection, for they will reign with Christ for a thousand years. This verse offers a glimpse of the glory that awaits those who have persevered in faith, highlighting that the final judgment is not just an end, but a new beginning. During this reign, all the evils that marked the tribulation will give way to righteousness, and mankind will be able to experience a full and rich life in God's presence. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be loosed for a brief period, as described in Revelation 27, 10. This last test will serve to expose those who, even in the millennium of peace, still hold a rebellious heart. Many will wonder why Satan is loosed again, and the answer lies in God's justice, which gives each one the opportunity to make a final choice. Those who choose to follow Satan will face ultimate judgment, while the faithful will continue for eternity with God. This is the last conflict where each soul's final decision is confirmed. With the complete defeat of Satan, the eternal state begins where God himself will dwell among men. Revelation 21, 3, 4 promises us that God will wipe away every tear and death, pain and suffering will have no more place. This vision is the ultimate promise that after all the suffering of the tribulation and subsequent judgments, the reward is a perfect and eternal fellowship with God. For those who have kept the faith, this is the fulfillment of all their hopes. The eternal kingdom is a place of complete renewal, where life is full and free from the limitations of sin. The final renewal also includes a new creation, a new heaven, and a new earth, as described in Revelation 21. 1. This verse reveals that the world we know will be transformed into something greater, a perfect creation without the marks of sin. Those who live in this eternal realm will experience indescribable peace and joy, for they will be in constant communion with the Creator. Every detail of this new world reflects divine purity and perfection. This is the ultimate destiny of redeemed humanity, where justice, peace and love will have no end, and God's presence will be constant and visible. This return of Christ and the final renewal are the fulfillment of the divine promises made since the beginning of time. By looking at this final victory, the faithful find the strength to face any adversity, for those who still live in a world of trials and uncertainty, this promise brings hope and encouragement. It shows us that, in the end, God is sovereign and faithful, 
and everything he has promised will be fulfilled. This is the beginning of a new chapter that will never end, a time when we will live fully in his presence, experiencing a joy and peace that nothing can destroy. In the tribulation, humanity will face spiritual and emotional challenges that test the essence of their faith. The suffering will be intense, and many will be tempted to abandon all hope. But amazingly, this period also opens a door to salvation, where repentance can transform lives. In Revelation 7.14, we see that multitudes who went through the Great Tribulation washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, indicating that even in the midst of such destruction, there is the possibility of redemption. It is a reminder that God's love remains accessible to those who are willing to turn to Him, despite immense challenges. The search for salvation during the tribulation will not be simple. It will require an effort of faith and a resistance that many have never had to demonstrate. Each choice becomes more critical, and the cost of discipleship can be extreme, both physically and spiritually. Revelation 13, 7 describes how the Antichrist will have the authority to wage war against the saints and overcome them, which means that those who choose faithfulness to God will face persecution. Here, faith is not only a consolation, but a constant struggle, and at the same time, a force that feeds the hope that final salvation will be achieved, despite adversity. In this context, many Christians will have to make difficult, even sacrificial choices to maintain their faith. Scripture mentions that it will not be permissible to buy or sell without the mark of the beast. Revelation 13, 16, 17, which creates a dilemma for those who wish to remain faithful. Imagine a world where obtaining the essentials to survive depends on renouncing faith. This scenario demands courage beyond what many are used to. Keeping the faith in this environment becomes an act of resistance, and every small gesture of fidelity takes on monumental importance. For some, this loyalty will be a real daily battle for survival. At the same time, God does not fail to provide help. In Revelation 14.12, we find a word of encouragement. Here is the endurance of the saints, of those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This phrase is like an anchor, reminding believers that despite external circumstances, there is a greater purpose in their faithfulness. Those who endure these difficult times with patience and confidence will be building a story of victory that will echo into eternity. For those who struggle daily, this perseverance is the key to inner peace, even when the world around them seems to fall apart. An important point is that during these times, there will be those who have never turned to God and in the face of the tribulation, genuinely repent. Repentance comes as a ray of hope in the midst of darkness and many will experience redemption for the first time. The words of Joel 2.12, return to me with all your heart, fasting, weeping and wailing, are a reminder that the door to salvation is still open. Even in the midst of suffering, the opportunity for spiritual rebirth is present. For those who respond to this call, tribulation becomes a path of hope and not just pain. However, this search for salvation is also challenged by the spiritual resistance of many who, even in the midst of so many signs, will choose not to repent. In Revelation 9.20, 21, mankind, despite torments, persists in their sins. This scenario teaches us that without a change of heart, even the most severe catastrophes are not enough to inspire repentance. This is the great paradox of the tribulation. While some turn to God, others move further away. For those who choose resistance, the search for salvation becomes not just a matter of physical survival, but a battle for one's own soul. For the faithful, the promise of salvation brings a comfort that transcends circumstances. In the midst of chaos, hope becomes a fortress. At Matthew 24, 13, Jesus says, But he who endures to the end will be saved. These words are a pillar of strength for those facing the persecution and hardships of the tribulation, reminding them that salvation is not a distant illusion, but a real and near promise. 
Faith becomes a shield against despair, and hope becomes a driving force that drives many to overcome the unimaginable, trusting that there is a purpose beyond present suffering. Ultimately, the search for salvation during the tribulation is a journey of complete transformation, where every difficulty becomes an opportunity for spiritual strengthening. Resistance and suffering shape those who, by keeping their faith, live with a higher purpose. The outcome of this journey still holds surprises, but the central message is clear. Salvation is an available choice, and at each step, the faithful get closer to the promise of eternal peace. Those who keep their eyes on Christ's return find, even in the midst of tribulation, a glimmer of glory that strengthens them to keep going. With Christ's victory over the Antichrist, the beginning of the millennial reign ushers in a time of peace and justice that has never before been experienced on earth. Revelation 24, 6 describes that those who have been faithful, including the martyrs of the tribulation, will rule with Christ for a thousand years. This period is not only a reward for those who have kept their faith, but a renewal of the earth, where all aspects of suffering and injustice are finally eliminated. Imagine a society where leadership is perfect, where peace is not broken by selfish interests. This is the scenario where the character of Christ is reflected in every aspect of life. During that time, the world will be a place of wholeness, where creation also experiences deliverance from the consequences of sin. Isaiah 65 20. 25 speaks of this period as a time when pain will be minimal and life long and satisfying. The descriptions show animals living in harmony and humans experiencing a life that surpasses current standards. The wolf and the lamb will eat together and the creation will be redeemed. This scenario is a reflection of the divine order, where peace is so real that even the cycles of nature adjust to obey the will of the Creator. Renewal is not only human, it permeates the entire earth. For those who lived through the tribulation period and remained faithful, the millennium is a spiritual and physical reward. They can finally rest from trials and walk side by side with Christ himself, feeling his presence and love up close. In Matthew 5, 5 Jesus says that the meek shall inherit the earth, a promise that is fulfilled here, where the righteous find their place on a regenerated earth. The experience of living under Christ's rule is not just symbolic, but a concrete reality that transforms everything around it, providing a life in abundance and full peace. This time is also a lesson that divine government is the only source of true and lasting peace. All human systems have failed to achieve full peace, but under Christ's leadership, righteousness reigns absolute. Those who participated in the first resurrection, as mentioned in Revelation 26, are priests of God and Christ and rule with Him. These rulers are not just leaders. They are examples of how to live a life dedicated to God. The government of Christ is the perfect pattern, an anticipation of what the eternal state will be, where holiness and harmony are the standard. Peace during the millennium is so complete that even the nations that survived the tribulation live in harmony. The wars that have marked the history of humanity are disappearing, and the conflicts between peoples and cultures are replaced by peaceful coexistence. Prophecies such as those in Micah 4, 3, 4 describe that they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, a vision where energy that was once devoted to war is now turned to building a productive and prosperous society. The absence of conflict is not an isolated miracle, but a consequence of Christ's rule that brings peace and justice to all. However, after the thousand years are over, one last challenge arises. Satan is loosed for a brief period, and he will again try to deceive the nations, Revelation 27, 8. This last test exposes those who, even after a thousand years of peace, still carry rebellion within themselves. Satan's release serves to show that true commitment to God is an ongoing and personal choice. Those who, even in a perfect environment, choose to follow the path of evil, show that divine justice is immutable and that good and evil cannot coexist forever. 
After this last uprising, the final judgment brings the definitive separation between good and evil, establishing the beginning of a new era. Revelation 20.10 declares that Satan will be cast into the lake of fire, never to deceive anyone again, a complete and irrevocable victory. With the end of all evil, God establishes the eternal kingdom, where only peace and justice prevail. This final judgment is not only a condemnation of evil, but the confirmation that the divine will triumphs and that the faithful will be able to enjoy a life without suffering or conflict. Finally, Christ's millennial reign is a preview of the eternal state we look forward to. The promised new creation, a new heaven and a new earth, Revelation 21.1, is the perfect outcome for redeemed humanity. This eternal kingdom is more than a promise, it is the final destination for those who have trusted in God and remained steadfast in the faith. The millennium is just the beginning of a painless eternity where God's presence fills every aspect of existence. For the faithful, this is the certainty that peace is finally here to stay. So after everything we've seen, the big question is, how do you choose to live your life from here on out? What Revelation reveals is not just a distant prophecy, but a warning and an opportunity to reflect on our own paths and the future we want. In a world that constantly calls us to distract ourselves from the superficial, the tribulation message invites us to go deep to understand what really matters. Are you willing to make that choice? The reality is that these prophesied seven years are much more than judgments. They are an invitation to transformation. And what are you going to do with this knowledge? Will you put it aside or use it to change your destiny? The power to choose is in your hands. Who knows, maybe this is not your chance to build something new, to seek peace and truth, to be prepared for what is to come. If you want to continue discovering more about these teachings and transform your life with what really matters, subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications. What comes next could be the next step in understanding your purpose, your future, and the promise of a new beginning. So what are you waiting for?